on Harare Conversation Platform. Uh, we are proud to host uh, Duncan Willie today and Gillian Atherstone, authors of this book, uh, Zimbabwe, Art, Symbol, and Meaning. Uh, uh, I would like to introduce to you to Mr. Chikupa as well, who is also joining us today. Uh, he's our executive director and uh, Mr. Matope, our operations manager. Uh, before we get into the details of the book, uh, can you, Gillian? Yes. Can you take us through what inspired you to come up with this work? What inspired me? Uh, yeah. Well, I'd say there were two elements. But firstly, uh, growing up in the country as a child, I experienced firsthand the big divide between black and white. Um, and then secondly, as I followed my, my passion for art and uh, joined the National Gallery in the, at the end of 1979, uh, I became aware of the, the broader nature of black consciousness, which I saw most powerfully in the forms of the stone sculpture of the 80s. Um, as as curator and exhibitions officer, and how black artists had a natural ease of communion with, with the material, a directness, and it's that directness which makes uh, of communion between artist and material that makes for great art. So, um, and I saw that quality also in the artifacts uh, and in the ancient architecture. So. Uh, I wanted to know the source of that consciousness. So it was, I realized I had to dive deep into the culture to look for it, which was really a 30 year journey, I, I would say, and <laughs> uh, scratching the surface. <laughs> okay, that, that's interesting. Uh, just to, or related to that is, uh, I see in this book, uh, Duncan was your photographer. And what is most interesting is not just his amazing work, but uh, that is your son. How, how is your professional relationship if we start it that way? Well, I, mean, I, I, see, I see his input is perfectly, you know, fitting into your, 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 your bigger projects. Well, uh, tell me. Yes, uh, th this book, could, could not have been done without his eye as an artist capturing this work through the camera because it's a it, it's capturing an art in life not, not a static object you know on a museum pedestal against a, a background it's trying to capture that living essence of art as part of life that these these ritual and, and functional things actually carried in the, the symbolism, it carried a depth of meaning that was part of everyday life. It was like an unwritten text. And um, so how do you capture that? You, you have to photograph the object in its, in its place of origin, in the place where it has life, where it fulfills its function. And you have to have someone who has the who has the sympathy and, and the experience to, to feel that and to respond to it. So, I mean, when I started my field work, um, Duncan was only about seven or eight. He used to come with me on field trips. And uh, I think we've told the story. I, I tried um, some commercial photographers, but just didn't get that power of the image that I wanted. So. I'll leave Duncan to tell the story from there. Um, <laughs> just, uh, just one, one short anecdote, and then I'll expound. Um, yes, Jill is my mum. So, you know, this work, I, we started, I started unconsciously when I was seven and eight and going with her on field trips and spending a lot of time in the archives of the National Gallery where, you know, where Jill was the curator. So I know these objects intimately. Um, but um, our joke with our, our sort of standing joke is that when we're working, I don't call I don't call her mum. I call her Jill, because it's a, it's a very you know it's a highly professional um, attempt, and and we had to keep it professional. Yes, to 
to to to get this done. Um, but um, yes, I mean, I sort of unconsciously picked up all of Jill's attitudes towards this amazing material that she had the 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 access to th through the diplomatic passport of the National Gallery. And for me, you know, as a small child, spending time with her putting up shows in the North Gallery or the PG Gallery or actually handling objects in the archives, you know, to actually go out later as a mature sort of young man, because actually I started photographing at, at 18 because Jill couldn't really find a photographer. So I, I just bought a camera and took it along. And, and the magic that came out or the, the, the desire that I had to photograph, let's put it that way, was seeing what I'd seen in a museum, sort of being active in its living context. And that was what was amazing, to see the, the art in, in action, in, you know, in, in society, in culture, in ceremony. And, and that was an enormous privilege to, 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 to be able to photograph. So I was quite a, a very neutral observer because I wasn't foreign to what was happening. Mm -hmm. um, but I was also very engaged because I, I knew Jill had a mission and that mission became my mission. So, yes, it's been a very, um, we, 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 do, we do fight a lot, but we have a good connivance, shall I say, to get the material out. <laughs> yeah. thank, thank you for that. Okay, to get into the details of the book now, um, I will start with the foreword. And uh, it was written by the then executive director, Doreen Spanda. She says in a forward, artifacts provide a mediatory role between world of domesticity, that is for these objects, and the spiritual consciousness. That is a powerful statement. And going through your book, I see that relationship between the artifacts and the community, the society, how they are of spiritual significance. Uh, can you, along those lines, uh, tell us uh, how you managed, you know, these are typical African, you know, objects. And we are in a space where previously you've been talking of the binary uh, position where it's black or white, black or white, black or black. How, how, how do you take it from there? You mean how? Ye yes, your, 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 your inspiration from the spiritual, the, the spiritual side of things. to the spiritual side? Yes. I think it was... Oh, wasn't, wasn't it difficult for you to appreciate, you know, spiritual things in a world where the society would be, you know, the perception is like binary. It's either you're white or black or... Yeah, exactly. You know? I think it was art that gave me that entryway. It was working with and being with black artists all through the 80s with my work with the National Gallery and thereafter when I had my own galleries. And I, I, I came to experience that aesthetic consciousness that mm -hmm. is natural to, uh, to black artists. And it, it uh, as I said before, looking for the source of that, uh, if you look at the bibliography, um, it was from first, it was from a practical experience with the, the spirituality of, of African community, which I felt was hugely embrace, uh, embracing and giving to, to a degree that perhaps was not so amongst um, the white community. The African community had that sense that all human beings were part of the big the great human family. Um, and, and they included one in that embrace, I felt that. But it was a 30 year journey uh, reading African philosophers, African writers, African artists trying to, because there's no one body of work which is titled African philosophy. It, it comes under so many different headings. Uh, and every point I make in the book about the spirituality of these things actually originates with an African writer and made sure that that would be the case. And it was, it was gradually through reading and reading and reading that I, 
I sort of was welcomed in a way into that intellectual, emotional, or spiritual space where one could understand and appreciate the, the spirituality of these objects and how they reflected, how they symbolized, uh, you know, a, a deeply um, metaphysical uh, philosophy of life, which is encapsulated in, in, the, in the philosophy of Ubuntu. Ubuntu is both uh, philosophy, science, and religion. And, and I say religion uh, in its African sense, not in its Western sense, in the African okay, sense okay. of a metaphysics metaphysics of man so i don't know yeah. where i uh is that has that answered your question and, and also yes, yes, yes. from a purely aesthetic sense um responding to the magnificence not only of the contemporary art in the 80s and and, and onwards but also the the artifacts themselves they they themselves have a presence uh, and a significance which you feel you know, they have an aesthetic quality and, and that's what these images and, and Duncan has managed to bring out so powerfully. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. And, 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 and um, on, you have a chapter on redefining religion that brings me to, to that uh, section. And uh, there's a, a, a section where you say African writers face the difficulty of translating their thinking into Western context that are been to it. Yes, because, it, yeah. because you know, Western culture is, is based on centuries of a mechanistic science, which encourages us to look outwards for truth in, into the, the material world. You know, science uh, prides itself on objectivity, which is the objective observation of the physical word, world beyond ourselves. But I mean, with the new science of quantum physics, that line between the human being and, and our consciousness and the rest of creation, uh, science is proving it actually does not exist, that we are actually as much a part of the universe as the universe is a part of us. And so, um, so Ubuntu is uh, Ubuntu at the center of Ubuntu is, is the philosophy of human being yes. as simply a, 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 a physical body. Mm -hmm. um, through consciousness, we participate in, in the being of all things and the being of others. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and I think. I think, you know, African philosophy needs uh, to come out, to be written, to be, to be shared, yes. and its principles have yes. got to get out there, because it's so important, you know, and, and has such valid truths about ourselves, and we need a new story, we need a new narrative for That's, um, humanity. Just on the, if I can just say one small phrase, um, one of the pillars of this book is to rewrite the narrative because um, in your question, um, it came up that, you know, the, you know, the as Jill, in Jill's answer, you know, the language is all sort of colonialist and, and just post-colonialist language has been used to interpret, you know, African, um, you know, culture and art. But how about rewriting that narrative as well? Because it has to be, you know, the tone has to be changed. New words have to be found and new concepts to, understand concepts which are different at the base um, to that language. So that's why I kind of like the inclusion of Jill's re sort of very often she references quantum science because that's a, and that's a way people find, might find quite strange. But for me, that is part of the fact that underlying that new narratives, new vocabularies have to be developed because yeah. stuff hasn't been talked about in the right way for a long time. So that's one of the pillars to rewrite and, and redefine a new beginning, a new narrative, um, along with everything else the book says. Uh, powerful, Duncan. Uh, 
what is interesting for me is, uh, is, is the fact that, yeah, like you're saying, it's, it's a way of rewriting and coming up with a new uh, narrative. Uh, but this book is coming at a time when we have got rising literature uh, on two key issues. Uh, you may call it Afrocentrism or uh, colonialism. Mm -hmm. We are trying to now say, let's look at it without the colonial perspectives. Mm -hmm. uh, and and, and then what exactly you guys are doing and uh, what you did. And uh, Dillian, uh, you're coming from a point where you are writing as a curator. Or I don't know whether I should call you a historian of art. Or <laughs> this is really like from inside, you're been curating African objects, so to say. How, how do you find the space in terms of this new rising literature? And this is a perfect, you know, a piece of work that contributes to an Afrocentric, you know. And, 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 and it's so interesting. Going through, I've seen so much work and reference to African scholars as well that uh, tries, pushes the idea that, you know, let's not be, let's not miss the point of who we are because we are benchmarking our things from uh, colonial, you know, administrators' perspectives. So this is a book that is coming at a time when there is that momentum and you are part of the, the, the movement now. Uh, can you share with us your feelings on that? Uh, and and uh, do you also happen to wish to have another publication that follows this one? Or other projects that could also complement the, the, the other you know, areas that you feel or think need also to be uh, given attention to? Very definitely. I mean, um, you know, Duncan has got three, two, two thousand, three thousand images. You know, we were limited to 214 in this book. So there's a wealth, <laughs> of, <laughs> there's a wealth of images there. So uh, very definitely we will carry it on down the line in expanding it in different ways. Because, you know, the material is there. And right. at, at what, when you say uh, this book is part of the rising narrative, I, I see that so clearly. It is, I mean, right throughout the continent in so many different ways, there are amazing things happening. Individuals, uh, mainly through individuals, you know, whether it be people regenerating community or regenerating uh, traditional food crops and food security or old wisdom is, is being re-looked at and we're realizing actually globally that the wisdom, yeah. the old wisdom of humanity is going to be critical to you know, our well-being in the future. And, and I think this is happening in, in, in Africa. It's, it's wonderful to see that, that, that people are turning back to realize who they are you know, and, and what they have, what the, the cultural richness that is there to draw on. Can I um can I add a point? Y yes, please. Going back to your um your your words of Afrocentric and um um and sorry I can't remember the other one, but um what's very important I've just realised that now um for myself although it might be obvious to others is that Jill has yes yeah, she's got an extensive bibliography, every sort of fact or or idea she's put forward that she might have um, you know, come across through talking with Nangas or with sculptors like um, um, Bernard Takawira or Lazarus. Um, you know, she's talked with a, a lot, a lot of Zimbabweans from village chiefs to the spirit mediums, um, male or female, to all the, all the sculptors, all the artists. Um, she, but every, every fact or statement she puts forward is backed up in a way or illuminated by the African scholars you, you've, you mentioned earlier. So her bibliography is very in extensive. And so it's like she's putting in context her thoughts in a larger sort of um, Afrocentric sort of field of, of you know, literature, which is coming out now. So that's, 
very important for the text of the book. Um, and I've just realized that it's exactly what we've tried to do with the objects because this book is what sets it apart from a lot of museum books and catalogs, shall we say, because this is not a catalog, is that the precept of the book is to photograph every one of these objects in its place of origin and context. So it's, it's charged and it's in its context um, participating actively. So in a, in a way, Jill's words are, are mirrored or supported by the Afrocentric literature about, you know, about what's happening now. Um, all the objects in the book are in the original context where they should be, where they take on more sense. And that was also the reason why we asked um, and we got the help of Doreen to get the, the, the birds, the Zimbabwe stone birds out of the museum and back into the ruins where they were originally um, in, as a way as symbolically stating what we've done in the book. Like putting things back in context where the context had been sort of, you know, trodden on and removed and hidden for so long. So, yeah, that's my observation. Oh, oh, oh thank you for that, Duncan. Uh, what is also most interesting in this book is uh, how you, you guys managed to, to make a representation of the diverse communities that we have in Zimbabwe, from the Tonga, the Bele, Kore Kore, you know, Manyika, and all parts of Zimbabwe into this wonderful work. Um, for those that have joined us uh, uh, on this platform, we are discussing a book, Zimbabwe Art, Symbol and Meaning, which was written by Gillian Anatha Stone and Duncan William. So we are in the middle of discussing this book before we, I open up the dialogue to all the participants in this platform, uh, I would like to ask you one thing, Gillian, yeah. or Duncan, if you can take it. Um, what, what do you consider to be the main argument of this book? To be the, 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 the main, you know, thought line or argument that you are putting across? Um. I would say it is how African culture evolved the symbolism of art as a meta language through which to express a deeply holistic philosophy and, and how that philosophy is expressed across life in the living yeah. spaces, in the rituals, in the greetings, in the social occasions, in ritual occasions. Um, so it's not a body of writing in a book, it's a living text in life, written yes. in, the, in the language of a symbol. And I, I think that is the most amazing, uh, it's the most amazingly complex and, and it, it's reflective of a deep insight into, the, into con human consciousness. And I think this is an enormous contribution that African philosophy has to make is her insight into what is consciousness in its holistic uh, working. Um, so, and also it speaks to, to the breadth of African philosophy, how it, it talks about the uh, living law relationship, which is an operative living law in the universe and therefore operative also in man and that all our systems and all our uh, our society and our ways of life must be lived according to the laws of the universe, you know, the laws of relationship. And because we've turned away from that in a materialistic world, that is why we're facing the crises we're facing now, uh, climate change, because we've been blind to the law of relationship in which all things are interconnected and all things are codependent on each other. And this is what Africa saw so powerfully and what she based her whole philosophy of, of human community and, and human being in the, in the philosophy of Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, that's, that's interesting. Uh, for, for, for our participants on this platform, if you feel you have got a question just uh, put it on chat or raise your hand. 
that we can notice you and we give you the platform. Uh, but for, for, for now, it's open to us to discuss this whole thing together. It's unfortunate we couldn't distribute all the copies to everyone who is here, but like the book is saying, it's about Zimbabwe art, symbol, and meaning. Um, Gillian, get back, get, getting back to you, uh, like you have just said, uh, these objects need not to be discussed or, you know, uh, looked into in isolation without the, the people, without their, you know, philosophical way of life. And then, then the, this is quite interesting. And uh, what would seem to be not fair is you have got a good relationship with a lot of good artists who are from Zimbabwe. And you have managed to put, you know, this work, it's, I don't know whether I should call it as a curator or as a researcher, but, but uh, what is not fair for me, most of these artists or for most of the curators is that they do not have the time to put it in writing their works they do not have the time to start and publish on this and this is what exactly you've done uh what 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 do you think could be the the way forward for for curators for artists you know like you said in your book there are a lot of you know prominent artists who are coming from zimbabwe from southern africa and they are doing a lot of work you know they are international in terms of the quality of their works you see but uh, they may not have the time to look into their work and publish it or to write about it. What do you think should be the way forward and how do we fill in that you know, uh, gap? I think there's a new generation of young Zimbabweans uh, who, who are going into all these various disciplines. I, I recently met one uh, uh, online uh, young Zimbabwean girl doing curatorship, studying, doing a PhD in curatorship in, in London. Uh, and so I think, I think the, the, the onus is on them to, is on the younger generation to, uh, you know, to turn to the to scholarship of, of their own cultural traditions and history. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I, I think this is going to happen. It is happening. Mm -hmm. Admittedly, it's it, it's difficult. It needs funding. It needs a salary. <laughs> this is. <laughs> 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 but what that, what can help is the digital platforms because certainly this publication we've done, you know, we're very high end sort of stand um, quality you know, printing, um, but. You know, there's all there's lots of platforms you know, which are freely available on you know, on online um, blogs and I mean I think that's a good way to, to get started to start documenting information writing down you know getting dialogues going uh, because that's basically free um, you know, publishing something on paper is a bit different um, but I think if you establish a reputation and build up a body of work online there will always be a publisher um to you know to put it on to paper so it can be available for schools and and for consultation in the galleries for example one interesting thing is i mean zimbabweans are highly connected that is the nature of zimbabwean culture and of course they're all very much connected on social media yeah. and i've often thought that that actually is an amazing resource for people to ask for information, to research, get people's memories of their grandmother's uh, her, uh, dishes or what, what she, the customs they they observed at certain times of the year, harvest, etc., to write stories about them. Social media would be a great platform to start exchanging and generating that information and making it available and making it available to scholars to, to pull it all together and write it up. You know, it's important to do it before, before those kind of memories are gone, you know, and, and mm -hmm. these ways of life are gone. Mm -hmm. and, and some of the memory could be just, you know, obliteration would be just by age. People get, you know, 
uh, aged and uh, memory loss and all that's those kind of uh, unfortunate things that's and uh, and and the best thing is to engage them to take the information from them and the wisdom from them and to make use of it through publications such as this and then and, and like Duncan is saying you are in, in, in possession of more than 3,000 images on this very important subject yeah and and, 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 and then what would be if there is another project that will then you know bring on board some of these guys at least you know to, 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 to see things from the way you uh, are doing it something like that we, we need the, the, these guys to be coming on board to realize how important and educative yeah. it is for their you know objects their works uh, as sculptors you know as painters mm -hmm. as, forms of artists you see well, i very much like what you said livingston because i've asked myself that question what do it, it took us jill and i four sessions of one week she would come down to london where i am and she would stay with me for a week and we'd go to my studio every day and we went to get down from 2000 images to 200 for the book and to construct a narrative to make sense of the images um, from the architecture of the Great Zimbabwe ruins to the staffs and the, 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 um, the headrests and the, the neckwear and the gorna and all these different objects and the weaving, um, the goods and mats. And um, so it would take us, it took us four sessions of one week to, to get the structure and to choose these images, um, which speak the most about what we've got. And so my question is what, yes, what, what, I don't want the other two and a half, three thousand images to sit in in hard drives and not be available because that's that for me that's nonsensical. So <laughs> we, are, we are thinking about how to move this forward. Um, but what's interesting now is, for me, this book is it's now got a life of its own, and so it, it kind of works. It can work like a hub, and it, so for example. Once we get to maybe spring, when people are able to move again, maybe we could do a proper book launch with a, you know, books on hand at the National Gallery. And from there, discussions and maybe workshops or whatever you know, people on the ground in Zimbabwe come up with or how they react to this book might find the way forward for the other material we have. And that's what I find exciting. Um, there could be a second, yeah, it's... It's a call to like action, I think, this book, and as Jill says. And you know, starting just simply with a, a, a iconic uh, objects of, of Shona tradition, the, the tumble, the um, ceremonial staff. Now that, that's, yeah. they're symbols which all spirit mediums have, uh, the, the chiefs have them, and, and they, they symbolize the continuity of uh, the obligation to preserve the continuity of culture from generation to generation and, and the wisdom of culture. Uh, that's one of Mbuya, representing Mbuya Nahanda. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so that would have been uh, in the possession of a, a, of a spirit medium. And Mbuya Nahanda is a, is a original founding ancestor going back to the 11th and 12th century. And yeah, yeah. she had mediums uh, speaking for her through the centuries. And the, her last one, as, as all Zimbabwean know, of course, is, is, uh, was, was executed by the, uh, by the colonial government in uh, the early part of the century. But what was interesting in that, in the image Jill brought up with the, the Shana Tsvimbo staffs, they were also in Debele staffs. So mm -hmm. yes, we have tried to get, as you said, as many of Manika, Tonga, Shona, and Debele too. But obviously we've got 256 pages, so we couldn't get it all in. But we, we do have, the, the, what I could say, it's not that it hasn't been done before, but you know, in this, what I, what I, I specifically chose, like the top end cameras, which photographers advised me to get certain cameras without, for example, the moiré filter, like, like a moiré filter is what they put in digital cameras to stop the camera getting confused when it sees patterns. 
So I bought a camera without the moiré filter. So it wouldn't get confused when it sees the patterns on like a red so cloth or, or, or the pattern is on the sticks or the, you know, the, the brass wire work, which would have been gold back in the 12th century, for example. And so what, one of my missions as an artist during this book was to donate, sorry, donate, um, document all these wonderful patterners and textures and techniques the weaving of bark cloth onto ceramic pots with a double head and you know, all these objects that I've grown up around and to try and document that because those techniques are going. And when you talk about you know, passing things on to the next generation, um, in Europe, everything's been sort of documented from the 15th century, um, but you know, Africa had, had a different way forward. It wasn't um, and then it happened. So there's, anyway, this is my attempt to, to document visually the richness of metalwork, beadwork, ceramics. So yes, I think for contemporary artists, there's, there's a lot of interesting things in there. Uh, 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 th thank you for that, uh, uh, Duncan. Uh, the, the, the point here is um, the, the book is also looking at um, focusing on tangible heritage and uh, transmission is one key important uh, one key thing uh, in, 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 in African culture where it's really mostly it's, it's, it's less to do with the, you know, writing or, or passing through these other Western means but also practice uh, related to that uh, I would want to ask one question uh, which place or which part of Zimbabwe did you find to be highly connected to their indigenous materiality? You know, as you go through, you know, some places you'd find, oh, of course, these are traditional, you know, objects, but uh, not so much connection between, you know, what people are doing and how they take the, the, the objects. Which places did you find to be most connected to their indigenous materiality? If I can um, put it that way. Well, uh, of course, all these photographs were taken in... in what uh, Zimbabweans know as the communal lands. And for people who don't know Zimbabwe, these were the original tribal trust lands, so-called, established by the colonial state uh, for Africans. Uh, so it was in these, and, and generally, of course, these areas remained undeveloped. Uh, and this is where the, the traditional traditional living survived to a large degree because you know there was very little development and so all of these photographs come from communities in the communal lands uh, uh, right across Zimbabwe from Mudzi to Matoko Marewa in the east and the northeast down to Chipingi Chiredzi in the southwest uh, around Mazvingo Chiredzi uh, in the south and then Kersey to Lochul, uh, um, all those to the west, uh, mainly in Debele, and then up in, in the north along the along the banks of the Kariba Dam, the, the Tonga. Uh, uh, so, I mean, it it, it uh, we tr we uh, I tried uh, I travelled extensively uh, during my time at the National Gallery in all these places. Uh, gathering artifacts for the National Gallery's collection and researching them. Uh, but, uh, and I'd say at that time in the 80s, uh, there was a tremendous amount of, of um, traditional culture still left. But as we continued to photograph up until the 2015, you know, towards the end of that period, uh, you know, we saw the material culture increasingly disappearing as, you know, the hardship of people's lives really bit and, you know, yeah. families and communities were, were destroyed through immigration and poverty and they sold artifacts, you know, in order to survive. So it's out there in the common lands, there, there is still a great feeling for tradition, but you know, it's it's under threat. It's, mm -hmm. 
it, it's a culture which is under threat. Uh, just, I mean, the best way I can talk is through like memories and instances. So um, I remember this uh, spirit medium, I spent about two hours with her. Um, we were you know, photographing just her. And I mean, I just remember the whole morning we spent talking with her b before being invited in and just what she had to give. And she didn't eat any refined or any refined foods or wear any machine made um, shoes or objects. She wanted to remain completely, how would you say it, mum? Uh, spiritually uncontaminated by, you know, manufactured things of Western origin. Yes. <laughs> and what she gave us was so powerful. And the most amazing thing was because, you know, the story of the book is, you know, we, we wouldn't arrive in, yeah, it didn't. We didn't arrive on Tuesday and, and start shooting. For example, it was months of pre preparing through dialogue with Jill's collaborators to find sites and people who had what you just said—that attachment, that mm. a deep attachment. Um, and so we would find these amazing people, like this woman, and the, f she was fully prepared to give me what she would not give someone who arrived, you know, who called the day before said, oh, we're coming tomorrow. So, you know, they, she played fully the game and, and they really delivered on, they knew what they were part of in a way. Um, and it was amazing. So, yeah, I just thank you to, to, to all the villages and, and chiefs and people who opened their homes to, for us to, to get this work done. Um, and it's very just, humbling, I must say. You know, just, the... just one last thing, Mum. Um, when you talk about the spirit, we were talking about spirituality and the objects earlier, um, and in general. And one thing that was important for me here is, for example, you know, photographing these stuffs, you know, in in their places of origin and in these, you know, the Shano Central Living Space or in a, you know, in Debele sort of living space. Or Tonga, um, using the natural shape of the of the of these round um, huts, for lack of a better word, um, with one strong light point being the door, means they are taken in the light of their of where they of their own context. So you know they're not in the light of a museum on a on a infinity background. They are charged with the light of you know of Mudzi, of Murewa, of Binga. And for me, that's very important. Um, yeah, so. Oh, thank you. Gillian, you wanted to say something. Yes, I just wanted to say it was very humbling to be accorded such incredible courtesy, generosity, and friendship from all these communities. I, I've always been welcomed wherever we went. And when we spoke about, you know, photographing to preserve the culture. It was amazing, the response of people. Uh, they, I remember one woman telling me, you know, our culture is flying away like a bird in the wind. They were just so keen to participate in something that would, could preserve, you know, their cultural heritage. It was very humbling. What I like with, um, in the book, Jill found this wonderful quote by Tafi Maka, and he describes a a voyage he used to make to his kumusha when he was 5, 10, 12, and then as an adult and how things had changed. And obviously I didn't experience that in the same way, but in the same extent that he did, but I can really relate to that slow and sometimes rapid um, disintegration of, of what we're talking about from the f first field trips in 1982 when I was seven, eight, then you know, when I was 9, 10, 11, 12, and then when I was 18 and 20 up till, up till March this year. Um, yeah, the fabric does get thinner and thinner, shall we say. <laughs> and, 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 and going through your, 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 your work, uh, how important do you think memorializing this material culture is uh, in view of the, the, the information age that we are in, you know, 
uh, do you think for the young generation to the new technology how, how do you what do you think oh i think uh, the heritage of culture is fantastically important because it speaks to eternal truths of who is the human being and what is our moral obligation our moral relationship with with each other and with and, and with the natural world and with the universe it's it's timeless and we can't turn our back on on values uh, on, on cultural values because that's what makes us who we are as human beings you know we can't technology generally is valueless as is science by 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 a very definition science has to be valueless in in a way i'm probably getting into deep water here but uh it's human values we have to turn back to if we're going to recalibrate Mm. our way of life you know well, and start an, um, a new story of, of human beings just to follow on from what Joe's saying and from your question to bring it to a very contemporary aspect of the of art life shall we say is apparently in art schools in America um, for example ceramics you know, which had been forgotten about for the last whatever 50 years there's too many students now for ceramics for sculpture because you know the kids what do they get from a what do they get from a screen they get it's it's tactile but there's nothing it's so ingratuitous you get no feeling you get no sensation mm. it's slippery you get nothing and so it's like the you know the millennials or the, the 20 25 year old kids or 20 year old kids nowadays they want earth they want wood they want something you can feel tactile um something real so it's i think in a, in a cell phone you have you have exactly the answer that gives you nothing if it's got no battery um whereas you know earth and wood is you know that's that keeps us human it makes us happy whereas a cell phone really unless you're calling your friends it makes you incessantly unhappy because they're always offering you more and more of things you can't have and you don't want anyway so um yeah it's yeah oh, <laughs> thank you duncan on that one uh, uh previously when we have been talking about uh, uh the areas that were most connected to their material culture you Gillian, you you mentioned the the the, the, the communal lands or areas as the most you know uh connected places of Zimbabwe and uh, across the, 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 the country or the communal areas you were saying they were connected. Uh, so in that respect, do you think uh, the continuous urbanization of, 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 of these rural areas or previously, you know, communal lands is a threat to transmission? Uh, do you think uh, it, 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 it will in the future give us, you know, challenges uh, to this, you know, cultural heritage, or, or there could be other means to, 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 to we could, I mean, uh, handle it. Uh, the, the cultural heritage is, is about, is about human community and well-being. Um, you know, it's about the family, it's about the community and the community's relationship with the environment, about the society. So these are not, not things which fight with development. It's just that development needs to be recalibrated to embrace human values. You know, the human values of, of, of mutuality and interdependence. Mm. Uh, so I don't see any reason, you know, that that, that culture is uh, is against development. Mm. I think culture should be part of development. That's <laughs> I think we made a mistake in in developing without and leaving culture behind. Yeah. Mm. Duncan, do, do you have something to to add? Um, 
Well, I've noticed that, for example, the, the Rezzo cloth is becoming quite re um, prevalent in, in fashion in Zimbabwe, probably because it's been worn by one or two of the Mbira players. So I think this interest for, for like a wealth of knowledge, which is part of your identity, but which you don't really know much about, I think it, that desire, I'm sure, will, will maintain or can maintain access to that culture which is possibly disappearing and, and thus maintain it. So I think it's, yes, it's a question of, I think it can, there's no reason, as Jill said, that it shouldn't be part of a modern life. It's, um, it's just that like supposed progress and development always seems to forget the past, but actually, I, I, for example, there's a phrase about contemporary art or the avant-garde art, which is, you know, the avant-garde doesn't, the use of avant-garde is not to burn the past, but to keep the flame going. And I like that because we all think like, you know, the modern artists or Manet or Da Vinci, they burnt the art of the past, but no, they, they developed from that and kept it going through their own, through their own work. So I think, you know, culture can be maintained in a modern world. It's just a question of building the structure for it because the structure has been neglected or, or, or omitted because it's complicated. But I think <laughs> that you could actually enjoy it and will do it because we can't all end up looking like, shall I say, for lack of a better word, we can't all be Americanized or Westernized. That doesn't really work. Um, we're not homogenous. You know, that's, that's great for breaking down barriers, but we all need our cultural identity. So um, I think, yeah, some, there's a lot of work to do and it needs a lot of active players. The question is getting them and keeping them active when things are difficult. Okay. Yeah. That, that, that's interesting. My, my, my next question is um, both of you guys. Uh, uh, there is this page. Uh, okay, before I get to my own question, I, 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 I would be talking about uh, my next issue would be on Mbira. Oh, yes. And uh, you guys are saying it's becoming in the contemporary spirit, uh, a means of speaking against political and social injustice, quite interesting. But before that, let me uh, read you the question from uh, uh, Mr. Chikukwa here. Uh, firstly, saying congratulations on the book. Congratulations. And uh, his question is, this book is coming at a time when the issue of repatriation is going on across the globe. What's your thoughts on the Zimbabwean bed that is still stuck in South Africa? Ah. Um, Mama, let you talk while I find it. Uh, <laughs> but we, we agreed yours is a professional relationship. Uh, oh, sorry, no, Jill, Mama. yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. well, what is your thoughts on, on the Zimbabwean bed that is still stuck in South Africa? Uh, uh, the next question, I'll get back to you, uh, uh, Duncan, on, on, on the Mbira. And, okay. And, 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 okay, you got the page, but go ahead, please. Well, I think, as you know, a lot of the birds were dispersed in other countries, and they've slowly come back to the country. I mean, there were only ever eight, as far as I know, of these um, stone monoliths with the birds, carved birds on the top. And they're all now down in the museum at Great Zimbabwe, uh, where we took them out and photographed those in the book. So I think with so few remaining, it would be good if the last one came back to the country and uh, made a complete set of, of what remains. And another point about the, the Zimbabwe birds, you know, they are carved at the top of a long uh, shaft of stone. And there were actually hundreds of these slender sh uh, stone shafts found throughout the Zimbabwe ruins. Um, they, they were along the tops of the walls, 
around the remains of altars, in doorways. Uh, they were symbolic objects. And the tragedy of the early history of early colonial history was that unprofessional so-called archaeologists did a lot of digging. And you see photographs of these um, shafts just being thrown in piles and taken from the original, original place. But the stone Zimbabwe birds were part of the whole ethos of, of Zimbabwe, the great Zimbabwe itself. You know, the, the, the shafts were a symbol prevalent throughout the ruins. And, uh, you know, we only have the eight remaining with the birds on top, but they, as, as you say, they're, they're, uh, they're sacred items to, to Zimbabwe, you know, going back to the 12th and 13th century. And we see that we see that imagery being repeated also on the staffs as well um, of, of the spirit mediums. So there's a there's a long continuity of, of cultural expression in Zimbabwe. It is interesting because Livingston, we had, as you can see, these these birds are still on the on the how do you call it? The not the shaft, but the um, what's the word? Just a shaft of, of stone, yes, yeah, one of them. Uh, so whereas the one in, in the Hutuskyo Museum in Cape Town, as you can see, it's been cut off and it's been placed on a oh. concrete block. So that was done, I presume, in the late 19th century. And we thought maybe we can use Photoshop to, to take off the stone block and make it give it more of the prestige that it had before in the past when it was on the long shaft um, of, of soapstone. But that would have been playing with the very question that you brought up, which is the reality is that bird was trafficked, transported and cut off and now exists in Cape Town. So we didn't um, cut, we didn't Photoshop the, shall we say its current state out of the picture, we thought it actually brought um, more context to this bird. And the trick was to photograph that in context, but because it's in a in Rhodes's white office, it was very difficult to photograph, but I found a screen and that's actually a 14th century Spanish leather screen. And it has sort of gold and red tinges in it. And what I found interesting was that could almost be perhaps out of focus, a sort of material or weaving that they would have had in Great Zimbabwe, which would have had gold thread and ochre and different colors in it. So that kind of gives an idea of the prestige that bird would have had in the context of, of Great Zimbabwe. Um, but yes, to answer your question, the bird should come back and I think they are actively discussing that. Am I right? Have I heard? Is that just a rumor? <laughs> or am I starting the rumor? <laughs> yeah, you are. You are, <laughs> you are starting a rumor. <laughs> you are starting a rumor. <laughs> but but uh, related to that, do, do you think uh, the so called decolonization that we once spoke about in the beginning of this conversation, or we call it African Renaissance? So many people believe it remains a talk, a talk show without action. Do you, do you think? Uh, what do you think about this? Is, is this uh, the, the real position, or, or or you have other thoughts about it? I think with you know um, cultural restoration and 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 cultural uh, institutions need, need money, need funding. And, and I think the, the problem in Zimbabwe, of course, with the, with the condition of, of the economy as it is, that there's you know, very little money available for, for cultural um, development. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, throughout the centuries, art has always had patrons, you know, wealthy wealthy families or kingdoms who supported the arts and so art has always needed 
needed to be funded and supported by the society. I think there's very definitely um, an African Renaissance, if, if that's the, the, the word. Um, if you, for example, look at artists like Kehinde Wiley in America. So he's you know, one of the art stars presently. I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but um, there are many, many um, African-American artists who are really coming to the fore in a strong way, as they are in South Africa. They are Zimbabwean artists. Look at Portia Jvavahera, who's had a show at David Zwerner a month ago. And I think um, all these an African way of doing things which has been occulted, shall we say. Sometimes, <laughs> because I, I use words the way the French use it in the sense, because I lived in France for 20 years, so I speak French. Occulted by that, I mean, put in the shadow. So, oh. and now perhaps the, the African mind as Jill has tried to give access to through the text of the book and citing all these African scholars and writers for to give access to someone who wouldn't normally have that access. It shows there's a very different way of thinking. And for example, I read something about Kehinde Wiley just briefly a couple of days ago. He said he, he I didn't read the whole passage, but he said he wanted his art to arrive as if, as if it had been vacuum packed. <laughs> and so his paintings are pristine, clean, um, bright colors. The figures are sort of woven into the cloth, which is going to be sort of Ghanaian heritage or, or some other West African sort of design. Um, but it's, it's almost like a kingdom that never, that had ne not been allowed to um, fluctuate, not fluctuate, what's the word? Fructif um, well, my friend English is failing me at the moment, but um, like a kingdom that is there, but had been always been hidden in a way. So, but with his works, it just suddenly hits you with such a powerful statement with no, no baggage. Um, obviously we know all the cultural problems behind, you know, behind, uh, that a black American has to live with, but in his work, all that would be there. But what he delivers is almost like a Renaissance painting of pristine, clean technique, be it realist, photorealist, mixed in with the background of sort of very graphic West African cloth, um, but painted and simplified and um, amazing. So, and the same, I, yeah, I could talk for a long time, but I think the difference is um, the freedom of thought that is, is, being, is coming to the fore. And rightly so. So oh. I think it is definitely what you're saying is happening. Yeah. Uh, 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 quickly on this one, uh, uh, the the issue of 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 decoloniality, African Renaissance, uh, and uh, the the issue of repatriation that we are talking about. Um, we, we are talking about this book at a time when uh, these birds, Zimbabwean birds, they are still stuck in South Africa. And South Africa is our neighboring country. And uh, it's giving us an opportunity through your book. What is your general view in terms of repatriation of these cultural objects? Some countries like France have already started the conversations around repatriation issues uh, of materials belonging to Africa. Uh, but we still have this, uh, you know, challenge. What's your your, your view on, on on that? Um, Livingston, I'm going to ask you. <laughs> <as Whoa. somebody. laughs> I mean, yes, I, I mentioned. You know, it would be lovely to have the whole eight surviving Zimbabwe birds in one place at the. Great Zimbabwe Museum, you know, where they were found. Um, 
and this whole issue, as you say, of repatriation is certainly current. Uh, mm. But it would be like, uh, the National Gallery to speak on this issue. <laughs> but, but I also think, um, uh, just discussing it um, this morning with Jill, um, I think there's also reappropriation because I found out so many things about those birds by photographing them that I didn't know. And we all think we know the Zimbabwe bird, but we don't know it that well. There's, there's so many designs on the back and underneath and on the chest of, of some of them. And some of them, are, you know, they, they're composite birds. Some are, as Jill said, or battler, eagle, but some have like Zimbabweans knew about their birds more. They would also have a stronger relationship with them. And a very interesting phrase, Jill, what is the phrase by the ex-director of, of Great Zimbabwe? That not enough has been made of the cultural importance of these birds by Edward Matenga. By Edward Matenga. Yeah. He, um, and, and I think that is true. I mean, just the zigzags on the chest of the bird. You don't get to see that on the dollar coin. Mm -hmm. And on the back, there's patterns on the back. Um, so I think these birds need to be re-evaluated and seen maybe in the National Gallery where school children can come and see them and and they, they, they need a, almost a, 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 new, a new museum where one can see them better. Yeah. We need to, re, they need, need a, a reappraisal of, people need to know them better. I, I, I've been privileged, amazingly privileged to, to do what I had to do. Um, and thank you to um, the director of the Great Zimbabwe Museum. Uh, and what was interesting was um, one of the young archaeologists, we started talking, um, and it turns out he went to college with Richard Muderiki, who's, as you know, is quite a famous Zimbabwe painter now. So I, I like these, these bridges between contemporary and, and the past. Um, but yes, the birds have to come back. But interestingly, this discussion was being, was being had on BBC a couple of months ago. For example, if obviously there's always the talk of the Algin marbles, but for example, a lot, of, a lot of the artifacts that are in the British Museum were in and around Kabul where the Taliban blew up a lot of monuments. So one can criticize the British Museum, but at the same time, they've saved two or 300 objects that would not have been saved had they been in the proximity of the Taliban. So it's, yeah, it's a big discussion. Um, I mean, it breaks down cultural barriers to have objects in different countries, but I think it depends on the state of play when they were taken. If you think of the Benin bronzes, they were just written over as, as oh, you are, this is our, they were kind of gratuitously taken. So there's, it's a big discussion for sure. Um, it's, it's a big one. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I will not be tempted by Gillian to address this one today. Because uh, you guys, we are talking about your book today. Uh, but <laughs> in, in, your book, in your book, you use the so powerful images. And, and these images, uh, they help a lot to present a, 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 an appetizing you know, engagement with what you are putting across. And uh, this is quite, 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 quite interesting. But on a different note, uh, uh, your book is coming at a time when there is uh, what we call African fact book. The launch of the African fact book. Fact book. Do you think, yes, do, do you think, uh, uh, Gabiri, if you can mute your audio. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do, 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 you, do you think your, your book is, is coming in as a contributing factor to the rewriting of African culture from an African perspective, uh, in that perspective of, of the African book? 
I would hope so. I, I would hope it it acts as a as an inspiration to to people to carry forward because there's such a richness of material there, you know, to to photograph and to write about and to celebrate. Mm. Uh, and uh, you know, this this book um, takes a novel approach through art, you know, looking at culture through through art. Um, so yes, I would hope it. I would hope that others build on it and expand on it and and produce wonderfully more substantial books, <laughs> as they will do, of mm. course. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let me ask you this question, which is coming from one of my uh, uh, panelists here. Someone is asking you, what inspired you to shift from printmaking to paint, to painting and photography? Uh -huh. um, is the question addressed to... To you. <laughs> to me. To Duncan. Must be. Yes. Okay. Um, um, I think I was always a painter before I was a printer. Okay. So, I've, I've, but I've always, when I started art school in, in at Helen Leros, uh, she always talked about prints. So prints has always been like an accessory for me to get away from to get away from painting, because painting has a lot of problems. There's, there's a lot of technique involved. There's, there's a lot of possibilities, but with print, you reduce your amount of possibilities to what the material has to offer, like liner printing, black, white, very simple lines. So it's always like an accessory to, to help you deal with ideas in a simple way, whereby painting has like the bigger, painting is like the opera. Whereas you know, doing prints is is like taking a um, you know is like just singing your scales, but in those scales there's truth. You know, there's drawing, there's simple, simple materials. Um, the photography uh, has just for the record, I learned photography just to do this project. So when I was studying at art school, I would um, I would ask friends who are photographers about cameras, about how to use them, how to, what lenses are good for certain situations. So it was kind of like my hobby just to get this book done. So there was no real passage to photography. It's, for me, this has been my mission. Basically what happened was um, in 1992 at the National Gallery, I, Helen Leros put up a drawing of mine for the National Schools Prize. And there were big paintings, there were sculptures, there was everything. I've been invited to the ceremony, I don't know why, and then suddenly somebody says, oh, Duncan, you've won overall first prize. It was a drawing I did with these empty cows, which, and I then I almost failed my A-levels, and I thought, what am I going to do now? So I looked at that drawing, and I thought, well, if you've done that drawing, not thinking about it, but you've got that prize, maybe that's the way forward. And so that's when I thought I might be good enough to try to go to art school in Europe because I didn't want to go to another colony like South Africa. But we didn't really have the means to go to Europe, but in France, tuition was free. So work out the same price as going to Rhodes University. So I went, I had a one-way ticket and I, I got in because of that drawing that the National Gallery gave me a prize for. So I would not have done, I would not have had the career I had and we would not have found this editor all the cash to do this book if I had not got to France because of that drawing that I got that prize for. So um, so photography, I learned it on the side to do this project and it's been in gestation since 1995. So for long, 35 years, I think. Um, so there's been no real passage to photography. But the truth is to answer your question, your listener's question, I use photography in my painting. I use the space of photography and the fragmentation of photography. And I think that's kind of helped to do the book. For example, if, you know, if I'm thinking as a painter, if we go back to Zimbabwe bird, for example, well, if you see the shadow here under the beak, 
Well, there's no more beak because it's been broken off over the last 800 years. But there's a small shadow. And because it was 11.30, I waited till midday to have the light come straight down. And we have more of a shadow. And the shadow implies there's a beak. So it gives volume to the fragment that has been broken off. And also this cloud that's passing by here. That cloud, I waited for it to come past the bird. So it gives more, more pride to the chest. So thinking like a painter has helped me think about what I do with, with how do we create fragment, a hole from the fragments of the of Zimbabwean culture that we managed to put together. Um, and one, if I look at the previous bird, which is a very graphic image, what I like is this bird as well, as you can see, it's got no beak, but mm -hmm. in the gap, in the, in the rocks behind, there's a hole. And it's almost like that hole supplants or, or stands in as a substitute giving the idea of a beak. If I take this away, you see it looks like it's very short and ugly. But that gives the maybe the, the, the nose of the battler eagle in our minds. So thinking like a painter or like a, a printmaker made me make sure that that bit there, that fragment gives more volume to the birds trying to give it back its splendor of the past. Is that a good answer? Yeah, 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 definitely. Okay. Uh, uh, th th thank you for, 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 for taking us through that journey. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I thought completely you were going to be focusing on photographs, but anyway, <laughs> it was a means to, 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 to end through some, uh, some other projects. Uh, uh, colleagues, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, anyone to 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 to, to, to contribute to this discussion? Uh, you are free to join in before we uh, take the last uh, discussion uh, with our very important guest today. Uh, <laughs> Do you think, uh, in terms of, 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 of back to Gillian and, 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 and Duncan, do you think there is uh, something that needs to be done in terms of the legislation, the, 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 the police landscape as well, uh, when we are talking about repatriation uh, and, 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 and the heritage fraternity in general? Do you think or do you agree that there is more that needs to be done in terms of of addressing that, uh, what do you think of, of, of this uh, legislation landscape? Mm -hmm. In both, 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 both uh, in terms of efforts to repatriate uh, 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 artifacts that are outside the country, and also managing you know heritage within the country. Do, do you think our, our heritage is, is sufficient enough to, 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 to be looking into those issues? from what we want as a Zimbabwean, or there's more that could be done. Are you talking about the repatriation of the Zimbabwe bird? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I, I think that's, that would be a good thing. Mm. I, I, I confess I'm not au fait with the, with the um, legal side of, of that. Right, right but yeah. I, it is a, it is a current conversation that's going on, as Duncan points out. Very important. Yeah, in that respect, uh, thank you for that. Um, from my experience as well, we, we have some, you know, uh, because that's not of Zimbabwe, uh, that is related to the British South African police. Mm -hmm. so, but by the time of repatriation efforts, uh, we are united in our government to government in the agreements. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the efforts that I heard uh, will now post some press again, which means then some of the legal, you know, uh, guidelines, some of the not even be uh, applicable because they are now in private so from, from that angle, uh, from the as a 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 as a
they are we are putting a lot of state to be uh, taken care of. Uh, I will give an example. Uh, college institutions like the um, young women or women and stuff. So we 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 got that uh, they, they need to relook into that in a way that we can enable us effectively manage our size of collection and even you know, engage even the national institution for those things that we are about. It is outside the borders. Uh, I thought maybe I can with the French experience, African experience as well, you could have some sensitivity to that. Uh, kind of thing. Uh, that would be very nice. Yes, well, um, um, how can I say this? Well, the, the, the colonial um, countries generate enormous wealth through colonialism. So, for example, um, you know, in, in the book, swim with, with brass wire and turn in axes with brass wire in them and um, go to in 12th or 13th century, 17th, 18th century, being called. I put the African company took the artifacts which were kind of for gold, but served the double purpose to enrich themselves, but also to say there was nothing here. There's no culture. So it serves a double purpose. But um, time to give back. what is needed and a bit more than what's needed. The objects, the artifacts, the documents, and help put back still what was not. I think that would be a simple courtesy. Let's forget that how much England or, England or France make out of cultural tourism a year. They make millions and millions and millions. Because of the, the museum and history have. Well, I mean, we have also that amount of history, but these countries have helped to make it a lot thinner to serve purposes. So, yeah, you're talking balance around um, you know, these things should be given back and, and help should be given to maybe support museums, get them up um, and keep them up. Um, it's, it, yeah, it's, um, I think I've answered your question. It should be done. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. yes. Uh, before I look for anyone to do, who is willing to contribute to this one. Uh, this, uh, how do you think for our, our, our local friends? Uh, who would get copies? How do they make orders? Uh, 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 do you have an agent who is distributing? Uh, is the National Gallery? Okay, let me claim. Or, or are your only agent in Zimbabwe? Or, or where, where do you recommend? I, I know people will be consulting about this book, but you, where have you said that your copies should be distributed from? Uh, so that we have the information as well. Joe? Uh, th this is the problem we, we, we're negotiating at the moment to, to try and get uh, to try and get the consignment of copies from the National Gallery stuff that, that people can obtain it from you. But this is what we're working on. You know, don't forget uh, that we've funded this ourselves. You know, we've had no. We've had no um, institutional help or anything like that. Mm. So we, it costs a lot to, to buy the books to, well, and then on top of that, we have import duties on the book itself and on the freight cost. It's quite costly to get them in. So this is what we're looking for um, funding to help do that because this. Is where the book should be, it should be in the National Gallery, which gave birth to it. <laughs> so, the <laughs> National Gallery is at home and uh, it will get there. I'm absolutely sure <laughs> in time. 
and, and yeah, people yeah. Yeah, we, we, we hope early in the year that we should have some books um, but if anyone's out there with solutions yeah we as we said, this is a this is um you know, a call to people to do things so if people have solutions yeah we we're available to to talk um the company yeah. would bring in books the cost price, the cost of was forty-five pounds each. It was at the high end art publication by these you know, artists in Italy. So it is an expensive book, uh, but uh, we thought that the importance and the significance of subject matter warranted the best possible. So why we thank you to get and to myself. This is an interesting and, and before we uh, this conversation on the sidelines, we, we agreed uh can we have gone through all this you know that uh, we would do I mean, give him a to the choice himself to be a smart young guy. Then, in the end, in the end, in the end, in So, anyone to be picked to that game from here, but that, in the end, in the end, in the end, in the end, in the yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 no, guys, do you have anything to say before we round up? Uh, Just to thank you so much for this opportunity and this book launch. And that we hope we're going to be in person in the year and launch the book at the gallery, and copies will be there for people to buy. Um, and we hope really you should come it should be brilliant for us uh then can we have to yes, one last thing to say um not to forget that with a fresh version so oh yeah, yeah so this this one is yeah you can see some is up on the side and bar goes down on the other yeah. so we hope that this will generate um but more a lot of interest from French Zimbabwe. and um, once again um, yeah, I would like to thank you to you and the National Gallery and to Doreen and to Raphael both contribute to our thought processes and I just my biggest wish is just to have 100 of these books in the, in the four year of the National Gallery by March or April that is my wish so um, and to be there as well would be wonderful. So we yeah, we look forward to doing that, Livingston. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you, Duncan. Uh I, I would like to say again, thank you and, and congratulations for, for the wonderful uh, and the magical work. Uh Gillian, your parting words, your parting words. Uh, it's just so nice to be in contact with you. The National Gallery was was my home for a long time. It, it birthed this book. It's part of me, and it's just so nice to be in contact again with you all. And thank you so much for hosting us today. Yes. Oh, thank you. And it too many of your <laughs> uh, <laughs> second one, the first one, or whatever. It's really your home. Uh, thank you so much, guys, for being part of the conversation. Uh, we hope again to be meeting either in uh, the launch, I hope this COVID-19 lockdown restrictions will be off yes. so that you can freely, you know, transport your, your, your books to every part of the world. You can also accompany that process and be there to be with so, your uh, To Gillian, thank you, Duncan, for this interesting conversation. Uh, and to it again, we would also be inviting you to other related conversations okay. where we think you are interested in subjects. Okay. Extend the invitation. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Yeah. Wonderful. Is mute. Please. Uh,
Um, you can export the PDF button. Okay. I'm looking. Anyway, good to hear you again, Livingston. I look forward to um, meeting you in person. Thank, thank you. And it will be available to meet. I'm trying, but I can't do it. Hi, I'm, I'm not sure if I've got off the Zoom yet. Um, the leave meeting at the bottom. Well, I think I'm fit. Hang on. Off. Off, off, off. Hey.